The sleek headquarters of Neurotech Solutions gleamed in the morning sun, its glass and steel architecture a testament to innovation and success. I stood in my top-floor office, looking down at the campus I built from nothing, knowing that in exactly three hours, my in-laws would try to steal it all. My name is Jennifer Morgan, and this is how I turned a family's betrayal into their downfall. Another charity lunch, dear. My mother-in-law, Patricia Harrison, asked as she strutted into my office uninvited. Her designer suit probably cost more than most people's monthly salary. How domestic of you. Though I suppose someone needs to handle the social aspects while the men focus on real business. I smiled politely, used to her backhanded comments after five years of marriage to her son, Michael. Actually, I'm reviewing the final protocols for our new neural interface patent. The FDA approval came through this morning. She waved her hand dismissively. Yes, yes, all that technical stuff. Speaking of which, the board meeting has been moved up to 2 p.m. Don't worry about preparing anything. Robert will handle the presentation. Robert was my father-in-law, CEO of Harrison Global Investments, and increasingly a thorn in my company's side. Ever since his firm had purchased a 30% stake in Neurotech six months ago, he'd been trying to edge me out of my own company's operations. What the Harrisons didn't know, what they had never bothered to learn, was that before I married their precious son, I had spent 10 years earning my Ph.D. in neuroscience and developing a core technology that would become Neurotech's foundation. They saw Michael's wife, the woman who hosted dinner parties and attended charity events. They never saw Dr. Jennifer Chen, the scientist who held 12 patents and had revolutionized brain-computer interface technology. Their mistake, their very, very expensive mistake. As Patricia clicked away on her designer heels, I opened my secure laptop and checked the latest report from my private investigator. The evidence was all there. Falsified board documents, embezzled research funds, offshore accounts filling up with money that should have gone into development. The Harrisons hadn't just been trying to take over my company. They'd been systematically looting it. My phone buzzed. A message from Special Agent Sarah Torres at the FBI's Cyber Crimes Division. All surveillance in place waiting for your signal. I thought back to the moment this all started eight months ago. I had just announced Neurotech's breakthrough in neural interface technology, a device that could help paralyzed patients regain motor function. Our stock price tripled overnight. That's when Robert Harrison suddenly became very interested in his daughter-in-law's little project. The investment offer seemed generous at the time. Harrison Global would purchase a 30% stake, providing capital for rapid expansion. Michael was thrilled, his wife's company joining his family's business empire. What could go wrong? The changes were subtle at first. Robert suggested bringing in his own financial team to optimize our operations. Patricia began hosting board member dinners where I wasn't invited. Michael started coming home late, full of his father's ideas about restructuring the company leadership. Then came the staff changes. My head of R&D was replaced by Robert's nephew fresh out of business school with no scientific background. My CFO was pushed into early retirement, replaced by Harrison Global's financial controller. One by one, my trusted team was displaced by Harrison loyalists. But they made one critical mistake. They thought my expertise was limited to the scientific side. They never discovered that I had spent those years in academia not just studying neuroscience, but also learning from my professor's mistakes. I had watched brilliant scientists lose their innovations to corporate theft and patent disputes. I had learned how to protect intellectual property, how to build digital paper trails, and most importantly, how to appear harmless while gathering evidence. Three months ago, I noticed the first discrepancies in our research budget. Large sums were being diverted to subsidiary companies I'd never heard of. Patent applications were being filed under different company names, companies that all trace back to Harrison Global's offshore holdings. I could have confronted them immediately, but as my grandmother used to say, when you catch a thief, make sure you catch all their friends too. So I watched, I documented, and I built my case. The break came two weeks ago. Late one night, while working late at the office, I overheard Robert and Michael in a conference room. The board votes next week, Robert was saying. With our proxies and the shares you control through the marriage, we'll have enough to remove her as CEO. After that, we can move all the intellectual property to our new subsidiary. Michael's response made my blood run cold. 
What about the original patents? They're in her name. Don't worry about that, Robert laughed. Who do you think the courts will believe? Our team of lawyers or a housewife who got lucky with one invention? Once she's out, we'll show that the real development was done by our research team. She was just the front person. I recorded everything, adding it to my growing collection of evidence. Then I made two calls. One to the FBI's Cyber Crimes Division and another to an old friend at the patent office. Over the next week, I played my role perfectly. I acted distracted during meetings, made small mistakes in presentations, appeared increasingly overwhelmed by the company's operations. The Harrisons grew bolder, less careful about covering their tracks. Yesterday, I invited the entire Harrison family to dinner at my house. Over Patricia's favorite roast beef, I listened to them discuss their plans for restructuring Neurotech. They never noticed that I wasn't drinking the wine, that every word was being recorded, that each boast about their clever financial maneuvers was another nail in their legal coffin. Now, standing in my office at 1.55 p.m., I gathered my files for the board meeting. My phone buzzed again. Agent Torres. Teams in position. Financial Crimes Unit ready. Give us the signal when they make their move. I checked my appearance in the reflection of the office window. Perfect makeup, conservative dress, pearl necklace. Exactly what the Harrisons expected from their basic housewife daughter-in-law. The boardroom was already full when I arrived. Robert sat at the head of the table, my chair conspicuously absent. Patricia perched nearby, practically glowing with anticipated triumph. Michael wouldn't meet my highs. Ah, Jennifer. Robert smiled condescendingly. Thank you for joining us. We have some important matters to discuss about the company's future. Why don't we sit over there? He gestured to a chair in the corner, away from the table. I smiled back, channeling every ounce of apparent submission I cultivated over the past five years. Of course, Father. Whatever you think is best. The trap was set. Now it was time to watch them walk right into it. Robert Harrison stood at the head of the boardroom radiating smug confidence as he began his presentation. The digital display behind him showed Neurotech's organizational chart, with my name conspicuously absent from the leadership structure. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, he began, we're here today to discuss the future of Neurotech solutions. Recent performance reviews have indicated a need for more experienced leadership. I sat quietly in my corner chair, laptop open, watching the time tick down. The FBI teams would be in position now, waiting for my signal. But first, I wanted to give the Harrisons enough rope to hang themselves properly. As you can see from these financial projections, Robert continued pulling up a carefully doctored chart. Our current management structure has led to significant inefficiencies. The research division, in particular, has been unfocused. Patricia nodded sympathetically from her seat. We can't let sentimentality cloud business judgment. Just because someone had one good idea doesn't mean they're qualified to run a company of this size. I caught Michael shifting uncomfortably in his seat. He knew what was coming, the vote to remove me as CEO, followed by the restructuring that would strip me of all control over my own innovations, the patents they thought they could steal, the technology they believed they could claim. Robert clicked to the next slide. I propose an immediate leadership change. Harrison Global Investments has prepared a complete transition plan. Excuse me, I interrupted softly, raising my hand like a schoolgirl. Before we continue, could you clarify something about these financial projections? Robert frowned at the interruption but nodded condescendingly. Of course, dear, though these matters can be quite technical. Yes, they certainly can be, I agreed, standing up and connecting my laptop to the room's display system. For instance, these research budget allocations you're showing, they don't quite match our official records. The screen split, showing Robert's doctored numbers alongside the real financial data. See, according to our SEC filings, we invested $47 million in neural interface development last quarter. But your report only shows $28 million. I wonder where the other $19 million went. The color drained from Robert's face as I pulled up another document. Oh, here it is transferred to a subsidiary called Neuro Vance Holdings, registered in the Cayman Islands. Interesting name choice, by the way. Very similar to the patent applications filed last month. The ones trying to claim my technology under a different company name. Now see here, Robert blustered, but I was already pulling up more documents. 
The board might also be interested in these emails. I continued, my voice still pleasant. Detailed discussions about transferring intellectual property rights, backdating research documents, creating false development timelines. Very thorough planning. Except you really shouldn't use company servers for criminal conspiracy. Patricia stood up, her perfectly maintained composure cracking. This is ridiculous. You can't possibly understand. The complex financial mechanisms you used to embezzle over $142 million from Neurotech's research budget? I finished for her. Actually, I understand them quite well. So do the FBI's Financial Crimes Unit and the SEC investigators. Would you like to explain it to them yourselves? Right on cue, the boardroom doors opened. Agent Torres walked in, followed by a team of FBI agents and SEC investigators. Robert Harrison, Patricia Harrison, she announced, you're under arrest for securities fraud, intellectual property theft, and criminal conspiracy. The next few minutes were chaos. Robert tried to delete files on his laptop but found his access already blocked. Patricia attempted to call their lawyers but discovered their phones had been confiscated as evidence. And Michael, my husband Michael, just sat there, watching his family's empire crumble. One more thing, I said as the agents began their work. Those patent applications you filed? My friend at the patent office found them very interesting, especially since they included research data that could only have come from stolen clinical trial records. That adds medical fraud to the charges. As Robert was being led away in handcuffs, he turned to Michael. Do something. She's your wife. Control her. But Michael just shook his head, finally finding his voice. She's not just my wife, Dad. She's Dr. Jennifer Chen Morgan. And you never bothered to learn what that meant. The media frenzy was immediate and intense. Tech CEO exposes family fraud ring. Harrison Global Investments collapsed in FBI raid. Neurotech founder reveals corporate conspiracy. The headlines kept coming as the full scope of the Harrison scheme came to light. The investigation revealed that Robert and Patricia hadn't just targeted my company. They had a history of investing in promising tech startups, muscling out the founders, and stripping the companies of assets and intellectual property. They had destroyed innovations and ruined careers, all while maintaining their image as respected business leaders. In the aftermath, Neurotech's stock took a brief hit but rebounded stronger than ever once the full story emerged. Our neural interface technology received FDA approval, and the first successful human trials made international news. The company's value tripled, this time built on real innovation rather than financial fraud. Michael and I had a long talk in the days following the arrests. I should have stood up to them, he said, sitting in our kitchen late one night. I knew what they were doing was wrong, but I was too scared to go against my family. Fear is a powerful tool, I replied. They used it on you just like they used condescension and dismissal on me. The difference is, I never really believed their opinion of me mattered. We decided to separate amicably. Michael needed to find his own path, away from his family's toxic influence and away from the wife who had exposed their crimes. Last I heard, he was teaching business ethics at a university, a subject he now understood from painful personal experience. Patricia and Robert Harrison were sentenced to 18 years in federal prison. Their empire crumbled as investigations revealed decades of fraud across multiple companies. The restitution payments alone would keep their army of lawyers busy for years. One month after the arrests, I received a letter from Patricia, written from her cell at a minimum security prison. You destroyed our family, she wrote, all because you couldn't accept your place. I didn't bother responding. She still didn't understand that she and Robert had destroyed themselves. Their arrogance, their assumption that a housewife couldn't possibly understand their clever financial schemes had been their undoing. Neurotech continued to grow, but now I made sure to maintain complete control over our innovations. The board was restructured with a focus on ethical business practices and scientific integrity. We established a foundation to help other inventors protect their intellectual property, particularly focusing on women in tech who might face similar prejudice and attempted theft. The company's success brought speaking invitations from around the world. I always made time to address young entrepreneurs, sharing the lessons I'd learned about protecting their innovations. Never let anyone's perception of you become your reality. I would tell them. Sometimes being underestimated is your greatest advantage. Last week, I received an unexpected visit from one of our original board members, 
an elderly gentleman who had watched the whole drama unfold. You know, he said, I always wondered why you let them get so far with their scheme before exposing it. You had enough evidence months earlier. I showed him the latest clinical trial results, dozens of previously paralyzed patients now walking again using our neural interface technology. If I had stopped them sooner, they would have found another way to try again. I needed to make sure they'd never be able to hurt another innovator or steal another invention. The old man smiled. They never saw you coming, did they? All that time, they thought they were playing you. When actually, I finished, I was teaching them a very expensive lesson about judging a book by its cover. Now, standing in my office overlooking the Nora Tech campus, I keep a framed copy of that first condescending email from Robert Harrison, expressing interest in my little project. It reminds me that success isn't just about creating something innovative, it's about being smart enough to protect it. The pearl necklace I wore to that final board meeting still sits in my desk drawer. Sometimes I take it out and remember Patricia's words about sticking to charity lunches and letting the men handle real business. Then I look at the wall of patents, the scientific awards, and the lives changed by our technology, and I smile. Because in the end, the best revenge wasn't just exposing their crimes or destroying their empire. It was showing them, and the world, that they have failed at the most basic level of business. Never underestimate your opponent, especially when she's smiling politely and serving your favorite roast beef.